So it, it's a great pleasure to be here. And in fact, uh, uh, one thing that John may have not mentioned is actually this is my second time to give a Volweiler lecture. And um, so I sort of know now what these hosts who come back to the Saturday Night Live feel like now. So it's, uh, it's great. Uh, it, and this is just a great institution, and there, um, many of our trainees are here, and I am really looking forward to meeting them, and uh, it's just been uh, a wonderful, um, it will be a wonderful reunion, but also an opportunity for me to see a lot of old friends. So I'm going to talk about something that is really a new area uh, that we got into that uh, resulted by, from following some leads that we got uh, as we were doing research in the area of the gut microbiome. But before I start, I, I just want to mention that when I went back to look at what Dr. Volweiler did, he actually looked at a lot of diseases that had something to do with, um, you know, nutrition, metabolism, uh, and malabsorptive syndrome. So, it, um, although he um, Actually, I never had the opportunity to meet him the first time that I gave this uh, lecture. Um, I think he would have enjoyed some of the things that I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk about the gut microbiome, but in the context of some uh, very common disorders that I'm, I think most of you are aware of, uh, obesity and type 2 diabetes. Um, these are diseases that uh, have uh, emerged over the last 30 to 50 years and have really become uh, a major problem in public health as well as on a global scale. Um, now, this is a very short time in terms of um, evolution, and so th these changes are not occurring because of any uh, genetic drift. They're largely due to uh, environmental factors and also lifestyle factors. And it's, they're very problematic to treat. Uh, we all know this. I mean, I, am, in particular, I was telling some of the fellows that I went out with dinner uh, last night how hard it was for me to uh, maintain any uh, reasonable level of weight, uh, and I tend to be overweight. Uh, so I, I can personally attest to how difficult it is to, um, to uh, get back to a fit weight. And the challenge is this, and I present this in a very simple way. Um, so all of us are, um, our biology is such that we're on a trajectory where we basically will gain weight as we get old. This is one of the benefits of getting old. We, we gain weight. Um, and the, the interesting thing is, despite what we do, which is, you know, we, we might uh, binge eat, and then we go through periods of uh, uh, dieting. We always end up on that trajectory. And this is, uh, this is the problem. So it's, in, in many ways, almost futile for some of us to, um, to try to deviate from that trajectory, because it's very hard to do that. Most of us don't have the willpower to be able to sustain a lower trajectory. Now, 50 to 100 years ago, I think our trajectory was different. It had a uh, lower slope. Uh, we were leaner and we were more fit. So what has happened during that time? Well, I think that the, what has happened is that there have been uh, environmental and dietary lifestyle factors that have been introduced through Western uh, uh, urbanization that has resulted in uh, a general shift in gen uh, population metabolism, so-called metabolic set point or energy balance. So the challenge today is trying to figure out how we can change the slope of that trajectory. And this is a very difficult problem. I don't think that there really is anything that uh, works except for bariatric surgery. Okay. So bariatric surgery is quite effective uh, for the morbidly obese, but it's not for the general public. Uh, these are uh, essentially operations that uh, surgeons have created 
to bypass the stomach and significant parts of the intestine. And the original concept was that, okay, you're, you're basically de decreasing the absorptive surface area and you're making uh, the digestion of food less efficient, and this is how you lose weight. But in fact, I think we're beginning to realize that that is actually not what uh, is the uh, correct explanation for uh, why this works. And the observation was made very early on that in patients that undergo these procedures, they actually start getting correction of their metabolic abnormalities within 24 to 48 hours after surgery. This is well before any uh, loss of weight. So something has happened. Something about their physiology has changed as a consequence of replumbing their GI tract. So how does this relate to the microbiome? Well, there was a very interesting study and a very well done study by Lee Kaplan's group that was reported in Science just a couple of years ago. And uh, what they found was something that was very interesting. They created a model of bariatric surgery. This was a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. And what they did was they um, performed the operation in mice. And the reason that we, they did it in mice is that you can control a, a lot of things in the mice, their diet, their environment, uh, uh, their genetics, et cetera. So you can get clean answers. And what they found was uh, that initially all of the groups, so there were three groups, uh, the bypass group, a sham operated group, and then a weight match uh, sham operated group. Um, if you look at the blue line, the blue line is basically the sham operated. So all the groups lose weight initially. But the sham operated, once it's put back on a high fat diet, regains weight. But if you look at the purple line, which is the bypass, you see that those animals, even on a high fat diet, actually uh, maintain their weight loss. Uh, now, it could be argued that it's because they are malabsorbing food and their diet is uh, different. But in, in fact, what they did was uh, they did this weight match sham operated control where they had these mice that were sham operated on the same diet as the, um, the uh, control diet. And you can see that the object was to get them back to the same weight as those animals that had undergone gastric bypass. Then they looked at the microbiome, and they did this through an analysis of something called 16S ribosomal RNA, which is basically a stretch of their genome that provides a, a, a sort of a, uh, like a, a thumbprint uh, of their um, genetics that allow us to identify them. And by using this uh, technique, uh, we can um, assign these microbes in a sample to different taxons. And that's shown on the right here. So you can see that um, the sham operator, which is in the middle, has a pattern which is dominated by these blue lines, which are mostly firmicutes. These are gram-positive organisms. These are typical of um, uh, the type of microbiome that you might see in Western societies. But you can see that uh, with the ruin y gastric bypass, you actually shift. These are major shifts in phyla. So these, this is at the very top uh, level of this phylogenetic uh, uh, taxonomy. And you can see that there are marked changes in uh, the microbiome as a consequence of the gastric bypass. Now, if you look at the weight match sham, they actually, even though that they had lost the same amount of weight through caloric restriction, they actually have the same kind of microbiome as the sham operator. And this would suggest that there's something that was different about the microbiome of the gastric bypass that could not be explained just by uh, the operation itself or by caloric restriction. But the real telling... Um, story was this. 
So they actually wanted to see if those changes in the microbiome made a difference. So they did this uh, procedure where they took the microbes of the sham-operated um, mouse and also from the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, and they conventionalized, or they essentially did a fecal microbial transplant into a germ-free mouse, uh, a mouse that has no microbiome. And what they found was the phenotype of weight loss was transferred with the microbiome. So you can see the purple line, those mice lost weight. They were fr from uh, microbes that were derived from the mice that had gastric bypass versus those that were sham operated did not lose weight. So this, would, this was a very strong uh, set of evidence that would suggest that gut microbes actually can regulate post-metabolism. Uh, so with that backdrop, I'm going to now talk a little bit about our gut microbes. So the way I visualize uh, gut microbes is that they're actually an organization of cells within our body that represents an organ. So if you look at the definition of an organ, it's a differentiated structure consisting of cells and tissues and performing some functions in an organism. This uh, histo histology is actually a picture of our microbial organ. So we're on the uh, sort of the lower left side here, and then there's a line of mucus that separates us from our microbial organ, but you can see that this organ here is comprised of many cells, and those uh, that are up front might even appreciate that there's an organization to this community. You can see sort of a palisading of uh, microbes uh, as you move away from the mucosal surface. So these are mucosal associated microbes that have been assembled by, uh, over time, uh, a lot of them were acquired from our mothers, uh, and they were selected by our biology. Basically, we provide the culture media uh, to select certain types of microbes that we want to have as part of our biology. And that's what uh, is the basis of our gut microbiome. So this is really an organ within an organ, but it has very, very important functions. Some of the essential functions of the gut microbiome are shown here. It's well known that uh, they are important for protecting us against pathogens. An example is shown on the lower left here. And this is something that uh, this institution knows a lot about, C. difficile. So this is a situation where you basically create through antibiotics a microbial Armageddon. And what happens is that these organisms like C. difficile uh, take advantage of that and they cause this antibiotic associated colitis. And of the best cure right now, uh, largely through the work that Chris has done, uh, has been uh, you know, fecal microbial transplant which works extremely well. Immune development, that's been known for a while. There are both clinical and experimental data that would suggest that our immune system requires these sort of antigens to be presented so that it can be conditioned in a way that we don't react against our gut microbes and we don't react against our cells. We know that the gut microbes are essential for digestion of food and caloric salvage, also for gut development. Uh, I'll talk about energy balance, drug metabolism, uh, for sure, and other regulatory functions. So um, gut microbes are very good for us, and they're uh, essential to our biology. But there is a dark side to, these, uh, to uh, gut microbes, and uh, we're only beginning to realize that. Um, we had thought that, uh, you know, gut microbes are certainly a source of infection and uh, often the cause of sepsis. But on the other hand, we are, we're beginning to realize that they play a major role in 
complex immune disorders, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, which is one that I am particularly interested in, but also allergic disorders, asthma, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and type 1 diabetes. Cancer, uh, neurologic disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's have been, uh, the microbiome has been implicated in uh, contributing to those disorders. But today I'm going to talk about metabolism and how that's uh, uh, regulated and in some cases some of these disorders are mediated by um, our uh, gut microbiome. So um, I wanted to step back a little bit and talk about uh, how our gut microbiome can be changed. Because I think this is, uh, in some ways, the basis of many of the diseases that begin as a result of changes that lead to host micro uh, mismatches. Um, so this is, a, a, this is a set of studies that was done by a very talented former graduate student of mine, Suzanne Defcota, where she did a, a study looking at different types of diet. Uh, and the, the three diets, lard, PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acid, and milk fat uh, diets, are all high fat diets um, that uh, differ only in the type of fat that is in that diet. All other macronutrients and micronutrients were identical. And you can immediately see that the uh, sort of taxon profile of these other gut microbiome of these mice really changes. So with large, you see mostly fermented. Whereas with PUFA and milk fat, you see a predominance of bacteroidetes, and then with the milk fat, you actually see the emergence of a otherwise rare set of organisms called delta proteobacteria, and predominantly through a single genera called uh, Balophila wadsworthia. And in this paper, she subsequently showed that this emergence of uh, Balophila wadsworthia in a genetically susceptible host will precipitate the development of a uh, form of inflammatory bowel disease in these mice. So this is an example of how external factors, in this case diet, can have a tremendous impact in changing our gut microbiome <laughs> and then creating a mismatch between host and microbe. And if you are genetically susceptible, you could develop disease. Now, looking at how microbes might play a role in obesity, uh, I refer you to this study that was published by Peter Turnbaugh about five years ago, where he did something that was very simple. He uh, took the microbes of human subjects that were either on a low-fat, plant polysaccharide-rich diet or on a high-fat, high-simple-sugar diet typical Western diet. And what he did was he did a fecal microbial transplant into germ-free mice to see what would happen. And what he found was that those mice that received the Western diet microbiota gained a lot more weight, reflected here by increases in epidemic fat pads, and that was actually transferred through a couple of generations. So this was something that was transferred by the microbiota and was sustained because the microbiota was still present even in the subsequent generation. So that evidence was then expanded to a human study. And this was a study that was reported in gastroenterology three years ago. And what they did was something very similar, except in this case, they took uh, the, micro the gut microbiota of lean male donors and transferred them into obese male recipients with BMIs over 30. And what they found is over the course of six weeks, they found improved symptoms of type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome. Now, that uh, doesn't uh, prove that these things uh, uh, that the gut microbiota, at least at the human level, 
can have this effect. But I think it really suggests that microbes do more than just digestion and, and or immune conditioning. They are involved in regulating our metabolism. How did they do that? So this is where we got into the game, and it was really by serendipity. We were asking a completely different question. We wanted to know how gut microbes affect our biology. And we did a very simple experiment. We harvested the livers of a germ-free mouse versus a, a mouse with a regular microbiome. And we did something called, uh, well, we did gene expression studies. We wanted to see which genes were different. And in this case, we looked at the liver. The liver is your major metabolic organ. And uh, what we found was really astounding. There were thousands of genes that were regulated in one way or another by gut microbes in the liver. And if you look at those genes and you do a pathway analysis, two-thirds of those genes fall into some pathway that's somehow involved in regulating our metabolism. Now, that really surprised me because I thought it would be somehow uh, involved in regulating or affecting our immunity. But the majority of the genes in the liver were metabolic genes. And the very top of the list was something called circadian rhythm signaling. Uh, and at that time, I really had no idea why the, I didn't connect for me why microbes would be re regulating our circadian rhythm. But it turned out that if you look at not only circadian rhythm, but downstream uh, and uh, hub pathways that are associated with circadian rhythm, which include nuclear receptors, it told us a story that somehow gut microbes are regulating our circadian biology, which is going to have to have some impact on our physiology and, and our uh, well-being. So we learned a lot about circadian rhythm. And I'm going to try to cram a lot of information into one slide here. So circadian rhythm is uh, intrinsic to almost all life forms, from humans down to plants down to single cell organisms. And uh, what it does is it allows us to adapt to our environment in a way that we can control and regulate our energy needs so that, for example, when we're awake, we can uh, have the energy to uh, continue with our activities, and then at nighttime, when we're asleep, allowing us to rest and store that energy. Uh, it's, it's just not um, physiologically sound to be running at 100% all the time. So you need to regulate your metabolism depending on your metabolic needs. And that's what your circadian rhythm does. So circadian rhythm uh, has a genetic basis to it. In fact, it's well described. What happens in the morning is that when light hits your eyes, it turns on a switch. And that switch involves the activation of some certain genes that are called inducers for example, clock and BMO1, that then flip on a number of uh, genes downstream that turn on our metabolism so that we have the energy as we're awake and active. At the same time, when those genes are induced, they're inducing or causing changes in another set of genes. These are repressors. And these repressors gradually build up over the course of day and what they do is they shut down clock and BMO. And so as we approach nighttime, what happens is that they actually put uh, a message through to our metabolic system and, say, and says uh, to start shutting down all systems so we, we can rest and store energy. Now, it's well known that many disorders, some listed here, sleep apnea, sleep deprivation, shift work, blindness, medications, and obesity and metabolic disease are associated with significant abnormalities in circadian rhythm. Now, maybe that's an effect, but actually, if you knock some of these genes out, 
in a mouse, you will develop metabolic abnormalities. In some cases, it's not manifested readily in terms of change in body weight, but you become, the, it's definitely uh, where the metabolic machinery is askew. And in some cases, it will lead to weight gain, sometimes it will lead to weight loss, in some cases, no change at all. So it's very complex how all these genetic pathways are integrated and the outcome is determined by whatever the net balance results from these uh, different types of changes in circadian clock genes. So I wanted to show you what happens that this was an observation that really got us interested in this field. Uh, this was an observation that has been uh, reproduced by many investigators. Um, and this is where you put uh, a mouse on a Western diet. That's shown on, in the red line on the left. And they gain weight. That's not surprising. Um, but what's really surprising is that if you gave that same diet to a mouse that has no microbiome, uh, a germ-free mouse, and that's shown in, in the uh, orange line there, those mice are resistant to diet-induced obesity. So that's very, very, that was very interesting to us. But what was even more revealing is shown on the right. So if you look at daily caloric consumption, um, the green line indicates those mice that are uh, germ-free mice on a low-fat, regular mouse chow. Those mice have to eat a lot more food to maintain the same body weight as their counterparts. So what that tells us is that without a microbiome, their energy balance has changed. Something has happened to them. And this uh, suggests that microbes are doing something that changes our metabolic set point. So what, what are they doing to us? Well, this is a complicated slide, but I'm going to make it really simple. Um, because what's on the left side has been reported by numerous investigators. That's the, what happens with gene expression of certain circadian clock genes in the brain. That's the medial uh, basal hypothalamus, or in the periphery, uh, represented by the liver. Um, mice that are on a regular chow are in the blue line, and you can see how that has shifted uh, both in amplitude and phase when you put that mouse on a high-fat diet. That's not new. Uh, people have reported that. What is new is on the right side. These are all germ-free mice whether they're on a high-fat or low-fat diet. It doesn't matter. But for this particular set, of, for BMOL1, which is a, one of the major circadian clock genes, it becomes arrhythmic. And uh, less so in the periphery, but it's certainly in the brain. For this particular gene, it becomes arrhythmic. Now, that's really interesting if you think about this, because these mice are in the same undergoing the same light, dark conditions as their regular counterparts. So we always had this, um, this paradigm where we thought light and dark were the major and probably the only regulators of our circadian biology. This is saying that's not the case. This is saying our gut microbes are just as important and without gut microbes, in fact, those light and dark signals that regulate our circadian biology are not being transduced properly. So this really tells us that our gut microbes have a very, very important, probably evolutionarily determined role to control our circadian rhythm, which is as important as in light and dark uh, conditions. So summarized here is that Light and dark was always thought to be the major regulator of a center of our brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And from there, a switch is turned on that will regulate our physiology and our behavior. 
But without gut microbes, that doesn't happen. And in fact, there's a block. And the consequence of that is probably results in some of the metabolic differences that we observe just by putting these mice on a high or low-fat diet. Let's look at the microbe side. Uh, so this is something called a PCOA plot. This is basically an ordination plot. And the only thing that you have to know about this plot is if the circles are on top of each other, the samples are pretty much identical. If they're different from each other, then the, the microbiota in those samples are different. And so this is a study where, uh, again, we put mice on a high and low-fat diet. And you can immediately see that there's a difference in the microbiota. The low-fat uh, really separate to the right versus the mice or this microbiota of a high-fat mouse, which is on the left. It's a major difference. But now if you plot these samples, which were acquired over a 24-hour period, you plot them by time, something called Zeitgeber time, which is a chronobiologic uh, determinant, which is Zeitgeber zero is when the lights are turned on, Zeitgeber 12 is when the lights are turned off. But you can see on a low-fat diet, there is variation, considerable variation of the microbiota over the course of a day. So in, in this set of mice, their nighttime microbiota is different from their daytime microbiota. Now, look on the high-fat diet. What happens on high-fat diet is that variation is lost. And we basically begin to see a much, essentially a non-oscillatory microbiome, which is very different in membership and probably function from the microbiome of a low-fat fed mouse. Now, showing it another way, so this is by taxons, you can see that um, over the course of a day, there are significant changes, even at the phylum level, uh, from Zeitgeber 2 to Zeitgeber 22. And uh, that's represented by the fact that probably this is related to when they're eating. They're, they start eating, uh, so mice are nocturnal, they start eating probably around Zeitgeber 12. And you can see that their population is shifting with diet. So is diet the main driver of our circadian or our, our diurnal variation in gut microbiota? The answer to that is that probably yes, under normal circumstances. But it turns out if you don't feed these mice by mouth and you just feed them parentally, they still have sort of a diurnal variation. It's different, different membership, but you can still see an oscillatory pattern. So they're queuing in to different cues, and presumably these are things like changes in cortisol or mucus or other types of things that are changing within our own biology that it has its own rhythm. Now, if we drill down a little bit and ask the question, well, what are those microbes that are oscillating? So these are a few that we identify. Um, they fall into co categories like Clostridialis and Lachnospiraceae. You can see that they oscillate very nicely. They all peak after Zeitgeber 12. But the other thing that's really interesting is that when you put that mouse on a high-fat diet, you see how they disappear. There's no more oscillation, and there's actually uh, almost a, they, they're flatlined. And so this is how impacting diet can be on these so-called microbial oscillators. Now, if you look at those microbial oscillators, to ask the question, well, is what's common about them? Well, many of them end up being what we call fermentative organisms. These are organisms that will take dietary carbohydrates. So this is like dietary fiber that we cannot digest, but they, they're very proficient at digesting it. And they make these small compounds called short-chain fatty acids, represented here by butyrate, propionate, and acetate. Now, there's a great deal of interest in these short-chain fatty acids now because they have tremendous impact on our 
uh, immune cells that's been well demonstrated that they will regulate both innate and adaptive immune cells through a variety of mechanisms. But it's also becoming appreciated that these short-chain fatty acids have effects well beyond the immune system or even the gut and can affect things in the brain and other uh, peripheral organ systems. And I'll get back to that in a second. But I wanted to tell you that on the other side, that is on a high fat diet, there are also organisms that are, are a bloom. Basically, they, they, they love or are selected by the kind of high fat diet. And many of them make something else. They, they uh, in fact, reduce sulfate, organic sulfate, to form hydrogen sulfide. So this is the smell of rotten eggs, you know, when we pass gas. That's uh, essentially hydrogen sulfide. So if you look at these two metabolites, the question is, do they oscillate? The quest and, and the answer is yes, they do oscillate. So if you look at butyrate, these are samples collected from the cecum over time. You can see that butyrate has a very robust oscillation that somewhere peaks around Zeitgeber like zero, uh, and then it diminishes through the course of the day. But the other thing that is interesting is that its oscillation and its amplitude is markedly attenuated when you put that mouse on a, on a high-fat diet. Now, if you look at hydrogen sulfide, you see levels, low levels of hydrogen sulfide on a high fat, uh, on a low fat diet, which essentially is not not very oscillatory. But if you put the mouse on the high fat diet, you see that the area under the curve actually doubles, and you can see a slight oscillation. What do these metabolites do to our uh, or the mouse's biology? To answer this question, we did a special preparation called um, hepanoids. Uh, we, we took the stem cells out of the liver and we grew them under these growth conditions that actually allowed them to mature into uh, structures that resemble those that are found in the liver. Uh, and then we subjected them to different conditions, butyrate in the middle, acetate up at the top, and uh, sodium hydrogen sulfide, on the, which is basically the surrogate for hydrogen sulfide at the bottom. If you look at the middle, uh, in the blue line is the natural oscillation of a hepanoid uh, in absence of any stimulant, basically regular culture conditions. There's always an inherent uh, circadian rhythm to all living cells. All of our living cells have this. You, you add butyrate, and what you'll see is with both PER2 and BMOL, a shift in phase with butyrate. And this would suggest that butyrate is an active mediator produced by gut microbes that has the capacity to change our cellular circadian rhythm. Now, if you look at hydrogen sulfide at the bottom, it really doesn't do anything. So even though it may oscillate on a high-fat diet, it is not affecting this part, these, these types of circadian uh, clock genes. And then if you look at acetate, it also has very little effect. So butyrate has a very specific effect that is much greater than its counterpart, for example, acetate or propionate. Now that's all in vitro. What about in vivo? Well, in vivo, what we, again, we did a simple experiment. We administer um, butyrate intraperitoneally at Zeitgeber 2 or 14. And the control was where we administer saline at those two time points. And to make a long story short, there wasn't much of an effect of this IP-administered butyrate in the brain, but in the liver, you can see that it changes the ratio of PER2 to BMOL quite significantly, particularly at Zeitgeber 14. So let me summarize everything that I've talked about this morning. Um, so at the very top, uh, what I'm proposing is that our gut microbes, our microbial organ, plays an essential role in regulating our metabolism, as important as uh, visual stimuli of light.
but it's different in the way that it's it uh, what it's queuing to. It's queuing to things like when we eat, how much we eat, and what we eat. Those are cues that are very important to our brain as well as our peripheral organ in determining how to regulate our metabolism and our energy balance. The consequence of that is that they produce microbial signals. We think they involve a lot of metabolites like butyrate that then go to the brain and to the liver to create this overall circadian rhythm that is conducive to health, in this case, states of leanness. When you're put on a high-fat diet, the microbiome changes. It becomes almost arrhythmic. And another consequence of that is that the metabolic signals that are put out by this microbiome are very, very different. And they have very different effects on the brain and peripheral organs. And in this case, they, they promote, they shift that metabolic set point to promote states of obesity. In a germ-free mouse, that microbial organ is missing. It doesn't matter whether you're on a low or high-fat diet. There's no transduction of signal. There's no uh, metabolome that will feed into the brain or liver. But the consequence of that is, at least in the mouse, a default pathway that leads to state of leanness. So I couldn't, uh, I had to say something about the Cubs. Um, so I've been a Cubs fan for uh, decades. It's been very frustrating. But I think it was character building because, you know, you, you, uh, you have to be an eternal optimist. And uh, this year is the year of the Cubs. And I think that um, there is reason for optimism because all of this knowledge that we're acquiring now, we're all physicians. We want to figure out how to leverage this knowledge in a way that can help our patients. And I think that the, we, we have a long way to go. But on the other hand, I think that there is light at the end of the tunnel. So going back to what's happening in a high-fat diet or diet-induced obesity where there's a change in the microbiome, loss of this oscillation and oscillatory signals and change in the metabolome that then uh, changes energy balance in a way that promotes states of uh, obesity. What if we could identify and promote the so-called microbial oscillators that, are, uh, that flourish under condi conditions of leanness? Can that be done? And the answer to that is, yes, I think it can be done, because we've done at least two organisms we identified. Uh, they're both allobaculum. This is a, a group of uh, microbes that are part of your GI tract. And these, we isolated them to uh, pure strains. And then we put those strains back into a germ-free mouse to see whether we would get oscillatory function. And the, the short answer is yes. So when you put this allobaculum into the germ-free mouse, you can see the butyrate output is almost what we observe in vivo and in a regular mouse. That is, we see a peak of butyrate at, um, around Zeitgeber somewhere in the nighttime it begins. So this is sort of a proof of concept that maybe we can harvest these types of oscillators in a way so that we have a much more refined and specific, I guess you'd call it probiotic, that can be maybe restored, uh, that can restore circadian rhythm in individuals that are on these Western type of diets that uh, promote obesity. So the last slide is this. Can you have your cake and eat it too? And uh, I don't um, prescribe to this diet, uh, but this diet basically says um, that you know caloric restriction is not the way to go for approaching obesity. It's really going through uh, uh, better food choices. And I believe that. Um, but I also believe that there are 
ways that we can intervene if we leverage what we're learning now. And my challenge to my lab is that I want to, before I retire, I want to have a pill that I can take in the morning so I can eat whatever I want and uh, still stay lean. So that's their challenge. And with that, I'd like to actually acknowledge that this, a lot of, all of this work could only be possible through teamwork and involve many groups, uh, groups at the University of Chicago, uh, University of Wisconsin, Madison, uh, two of our affiliates, uh, Argonne National Lab and Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole, Emory and Marquette. So with that, I'd like to, and I'd be happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a truly uh, wonderful talk, and uh, we learned a great deal. I wonder if you could speculate on the high fat issue in humans, uh, how uh, we can reconcile the Atkins type diets, which are very high fat, and weight loss uh, as you go through this, because there'll be a lot of people blaming fat now, and yet we have this other model. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, Atkins diet does work. Uh, I've tried it myself, and it does work. Uh, <laughs> you just can't stay on it. That's the problem. Um, I don't know the it, the Atkins diet. It, it has been shown that the Atkins diet does change the microbiome. And I my uh, sort of hand waving uh, answer to your question is that probably changes it in a way that leads to the same end. That is. Uh, what happens in the middle, I don't know. But I'm guessing that part of the efficacy of an Atkins diet is by selecting microbes that, in, in this case, may not be uh, shifting the, microbiome, uh, the uh, metabolism of the host in a way that would promote obesity. 